There is an episode of The Lone Ranger in which this single frame appears. The masked hero has paused while riding on his horse. Positioned as he is, it looks as if a cactus has sprouted from his wide-brimmed hat. How strange! What would cause us to make that connection? At least two factors are to blame. First, there is a degree of resemblance between the two components. The crown of the hat and the cactus are of nearly equal width, and their shadows and highlights also converge. Our tendency to see them as connected is called similarity grouping. The second factor is positioning or nearness. Because the Lone Ranger has paused at this moment in this position, and because of the camera's angle, the hat and the cactus appear to be joined. This is called proximity grouping. If the Lone Ranger were to move, or if the camera shifted, we would no longer be prompted to see the two things as united. In psychology, these factors are known as perceptual organizing principles. Among the most common examples, as we have just seen, is proximity grouping, when things appear to belong together because they are near in space. Another common tendency, as the Lone Ranger has just revealed, is similarity grouping, when things appear connected because they have attributes in common. Curious complications arise when things are seen as a unit according to one grouping factor, but are seen as not united according to another. It is these tendencies that enable us, without thinking about it, to follow the action while watching a sports event, to observe a marching band as it passes in formation, to see a constellation, or to simply read a book in which letters are grouped as words, words combine as sentences, sentences become paragraphs, and so on. In all these situations, and indeed at every moment in our lives, we make sense of what is happening by seeing certain components as belonging together, while others appear as standing apart. These built-in biases of the brain are quintessential tools of the trade in designing camouflage. Psychologists have referred to these tendencies as unit-forming factors. Simply stated, similarity and proximity grouping enable unit-forming or connection, while difference and separation in space are likely to result in unit breaking or disconnection. In addition, connections are also a likely result of continuity as when things line up in space. Camouflers are not alone in making use of unit forming factors. As is evidenced by this series of posters, Graphic designers make incessant daily use of attribute similarities, proximity, and aligned continuities. Each of these posters is a tribute to a different variety of design. They represent, from left to right, graphic, industrial, and interior design. While each is unique, they hold together as a suite, like a set of dinnerware, as variations on a theme. Recurrent circles in the form of a plate, a sphere, and side views of a circular table and lamp are an especially important motif. In camouflage, it is by high similarity or background matching that a figure blends in with its setting. It is also by similarity that Mimetic camouflage occurs when an insect closely resembles a stick or a dead leaf. 
It is by high difference that the pattern surface of an animal or a disruptively camouflaged ship appear to be not one thing, but two things or more, a smorgasbord of separate parts. Through camouflage, the evocation of connection or disconnection can serve to enhance or to weaken the coherence of what we are seeing. But how do we make use of these same grouping tendencies in other activities? For example, when we write a poem, or when we make a painting, or plan a building, or design a poster, or a book. When I was preschool age, among my favorite things to recite were nursery rhymes, and the one that I especially liked was Hey Diddle Diddle. It goes like this. Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with a spoon. The first published version of this nursery rhyme dates back to 1765. In literary collections, it is referred to as nonsense verse. It is no doubt many things, but I would not dismiss it as nonsense. If anything, it is artfully crafted linguistic design, an exemplar of witty and finely formed writing. Looking closely at that poem, it soon becomes apparent that there are connections called end rhymes between diddle, fiddle, and little, and between moon and spoon. And of course, there are also consonant sounds that rhyme, called alliteration, between cat and cow, little and laughed, sea and such, and sport and spoon. In its oldest surviving version, the fifth line of Hey Diddle Diddle was to see such craft, so that laughed and craft were end rhymes, and the pattern of similar lines was then A A B C C B instead of, as I learned it, A A B C D B. As for the poem's subject matter, it may be useful to point out that, at least when I was growing up, fiddle strings were made from catgut, cheese was obtained from the milk of a cow, the moon was made of green cheese, the crescent moon, the cut-out shape on outhouse doors, was the same as the shape of a cow's horn, and moon was a vocal reminder of moo. In relating poetry to art and music, the American artist James McNeil Whistler no doubt made some enemies in 1890 when he wrote, As music is the poetry of sound, so is painting the poetry of sight. There are undoubtedly people who are unable to understand the point that Whistler was trying to make, much less agree with it. The American artist Grant Wood was not among them. Indeed, a review of some of Wood's paintings would show that he was well aware of how vital it is to strive for a mediation between connection and disconnection in art by the use of unit-forming factors. People may argue forever about the narrative meaning of Wood's most famous painting, American Gothic. But to the artist, that painting was a statement about a European architectural tradition known as Gothic style, which by the time it reached this country became known as American Gothic. His painting is a comparison of that architectural style with the body language of the steadfast devotees of manifest destiny who chose to inhabit its buildings. The title Wood chose is a spoiler, but an equally obvious giveaway is the house that stands in the background. 
It is a trademark example of a carpenter Gothic building, which was itself a subset of American Gothic. The ancestry of this style goes back to Gothic cathedrals and to their renewed popularity during what was known as the Gothic Revival. In its American Gothic version, it was simplified and refined, but certain characteristics remained that provide unmistakable earmarks, all of which Wood refers to in his painting. One of these is an elongated vertical posture, a gesture that directs us upward as signaled by the high-pitched roof, the vertical proportion of the side-by-side -side joined windows, and the stripe-like pattern of wooden strips on the surface of the building known as board and batten siding. The arched paired window at the top could easily serve as a logo for Gothic architectural style. And indeed, long before Wood made this painting, those tall, thin arches were famously used in the design of the Brooklyn Bridge. But American Gothic is not merely a comment about a style of architecture. It is as much a comparison of that building style with the lifestyle of its occupants, as if to say, you are what you live in. If we ask how Grant Wood maneuvers us into seeing connections between the couple in the foreground and the house they are in front of, the answer is soon crystal clear. First, he places the couple side by side, facing the viewer, which is one way to make them echo the side-by-side -side paired windows. He has also elongated the proportion of the figures to strengthen verticality. Not only has he stretched the figures, he has steepened the angle of the roof and elongated the facing halves of the arched window at the top. This is especially evident when details in the painting are compared with photographs of the house. There is a preparatory sketch for the painting which shows the farmer holding a rake but the artist had second thoughts and chose instead to give the farmer a pitchfork. And of course, it had to be one with three prongs so that the fork itself repeats the side-by-side -side paired window motif. There are other quieter factors that strengthen Grant Wood's trickery. There is a pattern on the farmer's bibbed overalls that mimics the shape of the pitchfork. At first glance, it might even look like its shadow. There is also a quiet reminder of side-by-side -side vertical pairing in Wood's rendering of the face of both figures of the philtrum, the vertical indentation that runs from the nose to the top of the lip. There are additional nuanced rhymes between the fabric patterns of the woman's apron and the upstairs window curtain, between the pitchfork and the staunchly vertical plant on the porch, and between the vertical stripes on the farmer's shirt and the board and batten siding strips. When Grant Wood's popularity was at its zenith, he was known as a regionalist painter along with other artists from the American Midwest, notably Thomas Hart Benton. As artists, both Wood and Benton were assigned to camouflage when they served in World War I. But both were also highly skilled at making poetry out of paint. This is especially evident in a painting by Benton titled Achelous and Hercules. The painting benefits greatly from its choice and rhythmic arrangement of hues, but it also uses rhyming shapes, and two shapes in particular, an oval or elliptical shape, and a serpentine or whip-like form. These two shape types occur repeatedly in this painting, but each time 
in a new disguise. At times, the serpentine line is a rope or an axe handle, the tail of a bull, the tail of a horse in the background, the outstretched arm of a woman as well as the wind-blown scarf she holds, the smoke of the steamboat, and so on. Meanwhile, the oval or elliptical form can be seen in the rim of the basket on the far right, the mouth of the horn of plenty, the tops of the severed tree stumps, the brim of the hat in the foreground, and so on. The logic that governs arrangements in Wood's and Benton's paintings is not unlike the methods used by a type designer when designing a typeface. It works by the thoughtful employment of connection with disconnection, of similarities with differences. In designing a typeface, letters, numbers, punctuation, and other characters, the designer must make certain that there is sufficient resemblance among all the characters in the font. At the same time, he or she must also ensure that no two characters are too highly similar. An uppercase T must not look too confusedly like an uppercase J, and a lowercase P must not be mistaken for a Q. To a bartender, to watch your P's and Q's may refer to pints and quarts, but to a graphic designer, it is a warning to be watchful of the confusion of different letters. One of my favorite book covers was designed in 1996 by Robin Kinross at Hyphen Press for a book by Fred Smigers, a Dutch type designer. The book is titled Counterpunch, and as foretold by its subtitle, it is about making type in the 16th century and designing typefaces now. The information in the book is enormously useful, but my favorite part is the cover. Here, counterpunch does not refer to a kind of blow in boxing, but rather to the process used to make metal type for printing in earlier centuries. The book's title is both large and in terms of its color, high contrast. Blue and orange are direct opposites on a color wheel, called complementary colors, so their hue difference is pronounced. But there are two other colors as well. There is the white of the paper, which enables the subtitle to be nearly as contrasting as the main title, yet quietly demure as well. Its reserve is partly due to being set in smaller size, in lower case, as well as in italic. The fourth color could be called a softened pastel green, so it too is somewhat muted, and yet it contrasts sufficiently with the background field of blue. The box-like green shapes at the top are vertically stacked to show the sequence of stages in the counterpunch process, which cleverly concludes below as the backward E in counter. Despite its differing color, that backward E nests gently among the letters of counter while making reference to the fact that metal letters used in printing were initially backwards as they are on rubber stamps. Thus far, we have emphasized aspects of the cover that make use of similarity grouping of colors, sizes, and attributes of letter forms, and with less emphasis, proximity grouping, in the sense that things are clustered. But there is also considerable use of spatial alignment, which enables continuity. There is a framework, a sort of buried skeletal plan embedded in the layout, but we can easily bring it to surface in order to see the alignment. Here it is in the form of what graphic designers call a grid system. There must be a more appropriate term than grid lines or grid system, but these are already in widespread use. I, for one, prefer the term 
broken continuity lines. It foretells that such lines locate where shapes or edges align in space, and that the alignment enables continuity between components that are spaced apart. But broken is just as important because layouts, like most forms of communication, are more engaging to viewers if they are somewhat puzzling or incomplete, which allows them to provoke us. We respond automatically because our inherent reaction is to try to fill in missing gaps, to connect the dots, to see the incomplete as complete in the process of encountering it. Gestalt psychologists referred to this as closure and considered it a corollary of unit forming factors. An especially persuasive example of the combined use of similarity, proximity, and continuity in a way that triggers closure is Canisa's triangle, an illusion that was first described by Gaetano Canisa in 1955. That illusion, from the moment we first glance at it, appears to be a white triangle pointed downward that floats in front of a white outlined triangle of the same size pointed upward and three smaller black circles. The odd thing about the figure, of course, is that one doesn't have to pencil in the edges of the white triangle. Once all the other shapes are drawn, the process of closure is triggered and we then automatically see the floating white triangle. As is apparent, there are broken continuity lines, some drawn in, some imagined by the viewer, that help to form the boundaries of the non-existent triangle. A zoologist, artist, and British Army camouflage named Hugh B. Cott made a provocative statement about art and camouflage. Cott said that the one makes something unreal recognizable, while the other makes something real unrecognizable. While I have always enjoyed that quote, I quibble with it now and then. I think there are moments when artists conceal as much, if not more, than a camouflage does. As noted earlier, works of art are one result of a mediation between connection and disconnection, similarity and difference, or continuity and discontinuity. But that, of course, is nothing new. The oldest, most frequently cited description of aesthetic form is that it consists of unity in variety. It is by now an awful cliché, and yet it is not incompatible with connection and disconnection, which results from our innate proclivity toward unit making and unit breaking. When art and camouflage converge, it is because it is essential to invite the viewer to engage in what E. H. Gombrich called the beholder's share, and what Arthur Kessler referred to as infolding. When an artist creates a form, while its mark must be compelling, it must be sufficiently puzzling or enigmatic as to enable a viewer to engage in recreating it. There is an extraordinary poem about this very subject that was written in 1628, more than 100 years in advance of the earliest surviving version of Hey Diddle Diddle. Titled Delight in Disorder, it was written by Robert Herrick. In that poem, Herrick describes how enlivened he is in the presence of a woman who deports herself and dresses not in perfect order, but in a manner that is sometimes called studied negligence. He ends by recommending that the finest aesthetic arrangements require some amount of disarray, some pinch 
of wild abandon. Here then is Robert Herrick's poem showing how he, like Mother Goose, used unit forming factors, similarity, proximity, continuity, and closure to produce an aesthetic arrangement. A sweet disorder in the dress kindles in clothes a wantonness, a lawn about the shoulders thrown into a fine distraction, an erring lace which here and there enthralls the crimson stomach hair, a cuff neglectful and thereby rabans to flow confusedly, a winning wave deserving note in the tempestuous petticoat, a careless shoestring in whose tie I see a wild civility do more bewitch me than when art is too precise in every part.